A class of biomolecules called carbohydrates are the focus of this video series, and the carbohydrates have the general formula CnH2O-N, which helps give us insight into this name carbohydrates. We can think of them as hydrates of carbon. And keep in mind throughout this series of videos one of the enduring lessons of this course, which is that biomolecules have structures and reactivity that mirror organic molecules in laboratory contexts. So the biochemical reactions of carbohydrates and the laboratory reactions of these molecules have a lot in common. In addition, we can think about the structure and reactivity of carbohydrates in terms of functional groups we've seen before, such as alcohols and the hydroxyl group. All carbohydrates contain at least one hydroxyl group. Additionally, all carbohydrates in at least one of their isomeric forms contain a carbonyl group, and this is a ketone or aldehyde. And so we can understand the structure, properties, and reactivity of carbohydrates in terms of these functional groups that we've seen before. These videos will hit on three key general aspects of carbohydrates. The first is some issues of nomenclature, and here we're not so concerned with the specific names of particular sugars, although we'll see a number of specific names throughout this series of videos, but we're more interested in how we classify and typify different carbohydrates, distinguishing between, for example, those that contain aldehydes, like the structure shown here, and those that contain ketones, or classifying them based on the number of carbons. We're also interested in the stereochemistry of these molecules, particularly in this closed form that you see on the left, and this stereocenter that's created upon ring closure. And we'll talk a little bit about those nomenclature issues as well. Additionally, we'll be interested in the structures of carbohydrates, and we've started diving into this a little bit already with the recognition of the hydroxyl and carbonyl groups in carbohydrate structures. Many of the properties of carbohydrates really follow from their structures, and this is one of the main reasons we study structure in general. And finally, we'll hit on reactivity. And here again, it's all about the reactivity of hydroxyl groups, alcohols, and carbonyl compounds, ketones and aldehydes. And one point to notice now, and this is a point we'll return to again and again as we look at biomolecules, is that carbohydrates are typical of biomolecules in that they contain both electrophilic functional groups, an electrophilic carbonyl group in the case of the carbohydrates, and nucleophilic functional groups in the case of carbohydrates is these nucleophilic hydroxyl oxygens. And the presence of both nucleophilic and electrophilic groups within a single molecule is a hallmark of biomolecules. Carbohydrates have it, amino acids and proteins have it, and nucleic acids have it. And there's a very good reason for this that has to do with polymerization, these molecules reacting with each other to form long chains. We'll see specific examples of that in this lesson and in the ones to follow. Let's start with the basic structure and nomenclature of carbohydrates. So they all have the formula CMH2O-N, and they consist of chains of carbons bearing either hydroxyl groups or carbonyl groups. And so there's always one carbonyl group within the carbon chain, and the remaining carbons bear one hydroxyl group each. Now the different names of the carbohydrates correspond to different stereochemical relationships between the stereocenters within the structure. So D-glucose, for example, always has this relative stereochemistry with three hydroxyl groups, sen or cis, and one trans or anti. D-fructose always has this relative configuration, so on and so forth. Carbohydrates that contain one contiguous chain of carbons are called monosaccharides. They consist of one saccharide molecule, and these are also simply called sugars. An important way in which we classify the monosaccharides is based on whether they contain an aldehyde functional group or a ketone functional group within their open chain or linear forms. Monosaccharides that contain an aldehyde within their structures, such as D-glucose and D-ribose, are called aldoses. And the ald is, of course, meant to evoke the aldehyde within the structure, and ose is a common suffix that we see used for sugar molecules. Sugars that contain a ketone in their open chain forms, such as D-fructose, are called ketoses. We also classify sugars based on the number of carbons in the chain. And here that number of carbons shows up as a prefix on the suffix os. So for example, glucose is a six carbon sugar. There are six carbons in the backbone, and it's referred to as a hexose sugar. Fructose likewise contains six carbons 
within its backbone, and it's also called a hexose sugar. And ribose only contains five carbons within its backbone, and therefore it's called a pentose. Finally, I'll just mention briefly, if you're wondering about the D nomenclature here, there's a counterpart to D known as L, and this is a stereochemical nomenclature, and we'll get to the details of D and L here in a second. Essentially, the D and L prefixes allow us to distinguish between different enantiomers of sugars. The way we number monosaccharides is actually fairly important because these numbers show up, for example, in DNA. Five prime and three prime in a nucleic acid context are derived from this numbering scheme. And the way this convention works is that we start in an aldose at the aldehyde carbon as number one, and then we number the remaining carbons in order from there, so two, three, four, etc., in D-glucose. In a ketose, we start numbering at the carbon closest to the carbonyl group. Here in D-fructose, that's this carbon, carbon one, two, three, four, etc. We can also use these numbers to refer to specific hydroxyl groups within these polyhydroxy compounds. For example, if we look at this hydroxyl group, it's connected to carbon six, and so we can refer to this as the six hydroxyl. The numbering scheme gives us language to talk about the structure and reactivity of carbohydrates, so it's worth committing to memory. 